I think I'll start because we actually never really gave you an explanation for the logos for the different conferences. So every year there's a different snake, and you see amongst you people with teachers or coders from previous conferences with other snakes. And why did you choose that? Well, what these are are actually redrawings of old Viking uh, jewelry. Um, and we chose the Viking image because, well, you all know Ken Iverson was uh, descending from Norwegian immigrants to, um, to Canada. And the Vikings spread from the Scandinavian area basically all over the world. And there is actually a relation between where APL is dense and where the, Viking, the Vikings went. <coughs> So, it's a good choice. And the snake in particular means wisdom and strength. So we thought that would be appropriate for, for APL <coughs> conferences. Okay. So I would like to welcome you all, 91 delegates from these countries. Actually, this is a lie. And I promised yesterday that I would actually mention that we also have one Norwegian here, who is noted as a Dane. We have sort of one that's transferred from Norway to Denmark as well. So there might have been two Danes and two Norwegians as well. <clears throat> There's also uh, actually maybe one more Croatian that's hiding between the Italians. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, even a little bit more exotic than what you see here. So welcome to the John Hancock Conference Center. Um, John Hancock was the third president of the United States, and he was also an insurance man. <clears throat> he built this center to provide training for young women to work as secretaries in insurance. Very appropriate for an APL conference. Insurance and really VIP persons behind it. Um, or so we thought, or so we were told. Um, now, history and Boston can be a very dangerous mix. And I refer to the Daily Show, which we actually also get in Europe. Um, what John Hancock was, was he was the third president of the Continental Congress. The Congress uh, which were here before the independence, uh, when America was still ruled by the English. He was a merchant, owing a large fleet. Um, and he got into trouble with the British customs officers and was accused on several occasions of smuggling. And it's still debated whether he actually did smuggle or not. He was involved in the, uh, in the Boston Tea Party. And he was the first to sign the Independence Declaration. He did not have anything to do with insurance. He did not build this conference center. His claim to fame is his signature, um, to the extent that if an American tells you to put your John Hancock, they're not trying to abuse you or anything. They simply <laughs> want your signature on a contract or a piece of paper. And you can see it's, uh, it's quite... Uh, um, clear and lizard, and I mean, there's all sorts of jokes about this signature when he said it, that he thought that even King Edward with his weakening sight would be able to see who signed. The center here was built as a club for the Boston University, um, back when the universities actually thought it was wor worthwhile um, nursing the social life of the students. Um, in 62, it was sold to the Chandler School for Women, and that's apparently where the women comes into the story, we were told. Um, <clears throat> the reason why it was sold was that a large part of the members had been drafted to go to war elsewhere in the world, and there was crisis, gasoline, etc. So I think the university was probably low um, on finances. It was sold again in the 70s to uh, the John Hancock Mutual, 
um, and used as a training center for, the, for insurance agents. And that's where insurance comes into the story. But John Hancock had nothing to do with the insurance company. It was just named after him as, a, um, as an honor to his uh, reputation. He was vastly popular in Massachusetts and uh, remained the governor of Massachusetts until his death. It was a good story we was told and why we chose this place, but we find it that, that it's a lovely place. And it's true, actually, that in the library where we are having our speakeasy or bar during the evenings, there is two pieces, there are two pieces of wallpaper rescued from his house after it was burned by the English, or <laughs> so we were told. <laughs> But anyway, we also do tell guide stories in Europe. Um, this is Kronborg Castle, which is very close to where Morten and I live. Um, and once we were there, a guy we knew who also works as a guide there told us that an American lady had come to him and really begged him to see where Shakespeare was sitting when he wrote Hamlet. <laughs> <laughs> so he'd taken her up into one of the towers and showed her a small room there. And uh, after having been tipped properly, he made her swear that she would never tell that she'd been shown because he was not allowed to take anybody there. <laughs> so here's where... <laughs> okay. Right. The program. Today is primarily uh, dialogue presenting what we've been up to and what we are going to be up to in the coming year. There's an evening seminar tonight, uh, and that's going to be in here. Um, <coughs> and there's a speakeasy in the library, um, and it's open to midnight, or until there's nobody left. Tuesday and Wednesday, it'll be mainly presentations uh, from our customers, so We'll be willing to tell you what they are up to with dialogue. And Tuesday evening we have the banquet, and so we'll assemble outside in the big round hall for drinks at 6.30, and there'll be music. And the banquet starts at 7.30 in the dining room, <coughs> and then there's big easy until 1 o'clock, if anybody cares to stay up that late. Um, the program, there's always some changes. There's a typo um, prize ceremony for the competition. This year has been placed next to the coffee break. We will take that after the coffee break and not during the break. Um, there's three presentations where the people didn't make it here. So since it's modern times, we've chosen to actually try and see if we can get them to do the presentation via WebEx and audio. If that fails, okay, so be it. Um, before we would probably just have changed the program and taken some of the um, concurrent uh, presentations and put, but we thought it was by now safe enough to try it out. <clears throat> it's not my favorite way of doing presentations. I think we are here to network and meet with each other, so I don't like this, but uh, it can't be otherwise, so be it. Uh, it's Adrian this afternoon. Um, it's one of the three presenters uh, on Tuesday, just before uh, lunch. Anna McConaughey is going, also going to move it in. And it's Sasha, who couldn't get his visa in time to get here. And he's most angry, but he will be here with his voice. And, and a picture tomorrow afternoon. There's also a questionnaire for everybody. Please fill it out uh, by the end of the conference and hand it in to the conference staff. Um, it's important. We use it actually. We read them and we use it to make the conferences better. Come on in. Sorry, for a back wing. There is one spot up there on the third left row. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, I have to say, non-residentials don't have dinner included. If you would like to take part in the dinner here, uh, up to noon each day you can buy dinner tickets at the uh, reception desk downstairs, the hotel reception desk. Um, <clears throat> or if somebody else wants to go out, you can beg that dinner ticket. The banquet tickets, um, if everybody has discovered that they want to go to the banquet um, and has got a ticket, today until 5 o'clock you can buy them from the conference registration desk. It is Vidika and Karen. Okay, if you're in doubt about whether you have dinner tickets or banquet tickets, etc., look in the envelope. <laughs> if it's not what you expected, talk to Karen or Vivica. It might be a slight mistake, or it could also be that you don't know what you registered for. <laughs> okay, so just one sec. Oops. There's a couple of more yellow slides I have to. Um, those of you who registered yesterday, and didn't get a USB stick. They are now ready and you can pick them up from the conference registration. And session A will all be in this room, 202. Session B is upstairs in room 303. Um, to get upstairs, there are, are actually stairs in the corners, but it's a two flight climb. Um, it might be easier to go down to the reception and then take the elevator up. Um, but it's possible to, to climb the stairs. Okay, right. So I'd like to present to you the dialogue staff that's here. And please raise when you are mentioned. So first, Jeff Streeter. John Scholes. <laughs> he can't stand up. <laughs> John Daintree. Morning. Morton Mr. Dan Barony. Jonathan Mantelo. Way up there behind you. Andy Shias. And then Jay. <laughs> yeah. And Roger Huey, who's new this year. Roger joined us during the year, and uh, even though he has been working for us before as a consultant. And Brian Becker. Good morning. He's also joined us during this year. And helping Brian out in Rochester is <coughs> also little Brian, <laughs> or <laughs> Mac Brian, as we think we have finally. <laughs> um, and there's Vibeke, she's uh, the one you want for all the practicality together with Karen. And myself, and I'm already standing up. So, we bring all these people so that you can actually talk to them face to face. It's so much easier when you have to write an email or take a phone call if you would actually be able to put a face to the voice at the other end. But this year, is, it's different from previous years. We actually have one third of the staff left behind in Europe. And that's a new thing, because usually we bring everybody. But this year, we thought it would be almost intimidating if we just brought the whole staff. Okay. So as a company, we are growing. Um, and growth calls for more structure. It's not like everybody knows everything anymore. Um, so we've taken the drastic step of putting in a layer of middle management in dialogue. So Karen Shaw is now the office manager in Bramley, taking care of the daily, day-to-day uh, -day, uh, running of the company. And she's also responsible for uh, sales and customer contacts. John Daintree is the chief architect for Dialogue APL. And John is responsible for the architecture and design of uh, future versions of Dialog APL. 
Richard Smith is development manager and he manages the process of uh, resourcing and scheduling the development uh, of dialogue. And then there's Andy Shires, who's chief of operations and QA manager. And Andy is uh, responsible for all the internal systems that make a company work. And he's also, and you want to put a note against that, the master of the buck list and the request for enhancement list. The issue list. Oh, the issue list. <laughs> <laughs> well, I heard some of our delegates had been delayed because a plane was full of bucks, so why not? <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, this structure doesn't mean that we are going to turn into one of these companies that actually let you hang and walk around a maze of a phone system and let you talk to four people who doesn't know what they're talking about first. But it does, hopefully, it does mean that when you've spoken to one of our guys, as an organism, we are capable of remembering what was said and promised, and hopefully also able to deliver against it. And that's the firm purpose. It means that Morten and I have been able to delegate some of our responsibilities um, so that now we should be in a position to actually start marketing APL outside the current community. <clears throat> you might notice that this year, for the first time, if you ask me questions about the conference, I don't necessarily know. It's Karen and Vivica who actually has taken care of most of it, and uh, it seems to work out really well. Uh, Morten has started presenting APL at various other developer conferences. Um, this spring we were in Gothenburg, and in November he will do a presentation at the QCon in San Francisco. We are also doing presentation at several universities during this autumn, like the Copenhagen Business School and Lancaster University. And we are working on a new website that hopefully uh, will help us build community uh, within uh, for APL and Dialog APL in particular. So when we think about marketing, um, there's four groups of APLs that we sort of think about as separate uh, kinds of people or kinds of APLs. There's the domain expert, the guy who feels that APL is all he needs, um, and all he wants to know about, and that could be an actuarian or a financial um, analyst who just wants to do the calculations. There's the super users, the guy with a good idea, sometimes he's got a friend who knows a little bit about software. They want to build complete systems to bring an idea to market quickly, and so they need pretty much everything. <clears throat> There's large corporations using it either internally or to build commercial software. Um, they have what we call layered development, and I'll get back to that. And then there's the students who are just out of school or still at school, um, which we want to look at API. The domain expert um, might be the only user of the system, or at least an isolated user of the system with no other APL user to talk to. Um, for this guy, we must provide APL as a tool of thought. And all the stuff that we talk to you about here at these conferences, all the interfaces to databases and GUI and cryptography and networking and yeah, web services, he doesn't care about that. So it has to be hidden. It can't pop up and annoy him all the time while he's providing his solution using APL, the language. And this guy might just save the data and the code together um, in a workspace, just like he would do if he was using Excel. <coughs> the student, whether 
it's a software engineering student or some other um, student, they would probably today have some basic skills at IT. They have, would have been forced to use tools at the university, some of them being uh, IT tools. What they need to be able to do is recognize APL as a place where they can solve their problems and develop solutions. And they have to be able to integrate all the tools they've already uh, been taught and painfully mastered uh, with APL, like R, which is a statistics library, MATLAB, uh, Visual Studio Eclipse, and Subversion. So it has to be readily available uh, with APL. The super user, the guy that wants to build a complete systems and bring his brilliant idea to market. Um, one thing that we remind ourselves constantly is that these guys, I mean, every single customer we have, which brings us significant revenue, has passed to this phase. All of the last corporation using APL started out as a guy and his friend in a garage with a good idea. So these are our future customers and these must be satisfied. Um, so they need pretty much everything to build a prototype and bring it to market. They need both the language, the tool of thought, and they need all the integration. And Maybe if they're lucky, in 15 to 20 years, they'll be one of our three biggest customers. <clears throat> then there are the corporations. <clears throat> They've already reached a size where things are layered in the organization. Um, they don't particularly want their chief actuary to build the GUI interface. His time is much too valuable for that. And they want to be able to use all the things that corporations have, single sign-on, uh, corporate databases, um, SharePoint, um, portals, web designers, and all the logo and look and feel of the company uh, applications. And they want to know that APL can be contained and could be replaced if necessary. So in summary, the funny thing is, well, this is sort of integration requirements that these guys pay us money and these guys pay us money. But these guys here, the future customers are the ones with the biggest requirements, actually. And it's a bit of a, um, what should I, well, forget about it. <laughs> But it's something we have to have in mind when we say, well, what does, does it pay us uh, immediately? No, it doesn't. But we have to invest in the future. OK. But in order to attract newcomers, we need uh, to give them some help. Because, I mean, getting to APL today and just opening the workspace you really don't know where to start. So if you, you need to provide them with some help and some tools and templates that can show them how do you build different kinds of applications. <coughs> so to satisfy that requirement, we decided to start um, a new activity that is called the Tools Group internally. We might rename it for marketing purposes later. And Brian Becker uh, will be heading that group. Um, and he's responsible for the development of tools and the documentation of it. And uh, Mark Brian is helping him with the documentation part of that. The growth uh, of the company also forced us to find rooms that were a little bit bigger than the ones we were in. It was exactly in the same place, just a different building in the same development, so we didn't send out messages to everybody about the change because the zip code stayed the same. So if you send us a letter, we still get it with the new address. I had started, there was a really nice spot on the wall 
So I started to find a very good original painting that could go there. But Morton had been on Comlang, uh, no, Com? Comlang Apia. And seeing that Peter Wooster was moving house, and in his basement, he had kept Ken Iverson's original blackboard from the office at the IP Sharp um, uh, building. And so he immediately got Peter to send that, so we, we didn't have to pay for it, we just, just the uh, freight <laughs> to get it there. But man, was that expensive. <laughs> but here it comes, and some of you who are awake will recognize maybe uh, Ronald, who was the first winner of the dialogue competition, who did an internship last winter. <coughs> and here it is <coughs> in situ, in our boardroom number one. We only have one, but it says on the door, boardroom number one. <laughs> <laughs> and in Bramley, you are all welcome to visit us. If you are in the vicinity, just give us a call or an email. and. Um, come around and see how we work. Um, and we might let you touch it, <laughs> or even write on it. <laughs> and Roger has all sorts of stories about what was designed on that blackboard, so you can look him up and, uh, and get the stories. We'll also get a nice brass placket um, to sit next to it. Okay. So a dialogue, even if we are the youngest, of the APL companies and one of the younger of the array technology companies, um, we respect the inheritance we carry forward and we treasure the history of APL. So I'd like to end this welcome um, with a message from somebody who couldn't be here this time, but who has also dedicated herself to documenting the story and to build the story of the tribe. Um, Yes, I need to switch in and out. <laughs> <laughs>